started. It started. Okay, it started recording. Start. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the ExamSoft uh, webinar series. And today we're joined by Eric Ermey, who is the Assessment and Evaluations Manager at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. Um, Eric's going to present on a new methodology they've developed uh, to tag questions in a question database and then use that information to uh, work with students to help improve uh, learning outcomes. And with that said, I will hand this over to Eric. One other note is at the end of this uh, presentation, we'll have the opportunity to ask questions, so please hold your questions until the very end. Eric? Thanks, Ken. Um, and I appreciate you taking some time out of uh, your day, busy days to to spend some time learning about this topic. It's something that uh, we've been really pushing for at Ohio State is the ability to have better data and more data to understand our students and our curriculum better and to improve the performance of both. And one of the ways that we did that was we went and we developed a system for uh, categorizing questions that enables us to get this data. And that's what today's presentation is going to be about. Um, we're going to go through uh, a background of what we did, how we did it, what this system that we lovingly call the Teddy Q is, um, how we utilize the system within our curriculum, and then how we use the information that's a result of that system to uh, to improve student performance outcomes, to get data, get these performance reports about students, and use that with intervening with students and, and uh, making students, helping them get to the goals that they really want to achieve. We'll go through some applications and conclusions as well. Uh, the questions that needed to be addressed when we first started this was, how do we provide better and more comprehensive feedback to the students in the curriculum? Um, that was a, that's a it seems like a loaded question. It's a, it, it's a very large mountain to climb when you first start, because you want everything. You want to know everything about your students and everything you can possibly know about your curriculum to try and improve those things. And um, how do we do that? How do we approach that problem? And then how do we utilize information that we do get? If we if we we climb that mountain and get all the information about our students and about our curriculum, and we can examine ourselves in a 360 degree fashion, um, how do we utilize that information for intervening with our students and, and helping see performance improvement? Um, the desired outcomes from using the question tagging system that we outlined. Uh, which provide that better performance feedback that we were just talking about uh, to students and faculty so that we can increase our assessments relevance, improve remediation, um, help our students uh, outline areas of deficiency or areas of advanced competency perhaps. Um, we wanted to let them be better self-assessors, let them look at themselves and decide who what kind of student they are, what kind of student they want to be, and wh what can they do to improve themselves and, and Use, utilize this stuff for self-directed learning. Additionally, we want to create better tools for our counselors and tutors and the, the huge amount of uh, support staff and resources that we have for all our students who struggle uh, and for all our students in general, really. Um, we wanted to create better tools for them, um, give them um, something stronger to work with than maybe just what a student tells them or just the, the, the surface level problem that they can see, um, help them kind of dig in a little bit and utilize this as a tool to do so. And then we wanted to provide useful insight to our students um, on their preparation for licensure exams, because those are the ultimate determiner of, uh, in our case, whether you become a doctor or not, or you know, whatever profession it may be uh, that has licensure, that's, you know, that's the gateway, that's the barrier. And we wanted to provide as much useful insight as we could to our students to help them prepare um, in the best way possible. Uh, tagged electronic database of exam questions is what TEDIQ means, and we, you can see why we shortened the name. Um, but basically, it, it means taking categories or metadata, applying them to the actual exam questions, and then getting reports based on those tags afterwards. So any question that was tagged with certain categories, you then can see the, um, the score maybe of a student in just those category, so maybe only 10 questions had a particular category. Now you can start to decipher those things down, and we'll go through uh, in the next few slides what categories we chose and how we chose them. The category groupings we chose, uh, one was the curricular unit um, for just a, kind of an organizational standpoint. What question does this, this uh, or excuse me, what unit does this question um, pertain to, and where does it go, and where does it fit within our curricular mapping? 
who's the author of the question or the content expert. If the student missed this question and had no idea uh, what what the answer was, how they they got it wrong, why they weren't understanding it, who would you send them to? That's that's who we assign as the author. Um, most of the time, that's the person who wrote it, but occasionally with retirements and stuff, it's somebody else who's using other people's questions. What the question type is, um, we're trying to get the thought process here. Uh, what type of question is it? What type of thought process is necessary to answer this? The general area uh, for our for our census, it's in medicine of. Um, is it a normal process of the body, an abnormal process? Is it a therapeutic process, so on? And so what area generally in medicine does it pertain to? The subject areas, and for us, we use USMLE. Um, the, every school gets a report of 20 USMLE subject areas and their performance in those 20 areas after their students take the licensure exam step one. Um, and so we took those same reporting areas that they use for step one and applied them to our internal exams so that we can begin to compare, and we'll go through in a moment what those are. And then lastly, a specific subject subcategory. So within those 20 subject categories from USMLE, there's lots and lots of topics. And you know, we wanted to get to a more granular level for the students and for the faculty. And so our subjects are linked to subcategories. If you choose a particular subject, you then have to choose a particular sub topic, and that's much more specific than the subject. Um, and that gives a, a little bit more granularity, a little bit more focus on what the actual um, content of the question was, whereas the subjects are more of a broad focus, um, intentionally so. This is um, our table of, of categories, uh, and you can see there uh, we've got the curricular unit, and there's a list of what we use for our curricular units. The authors, there's hundreds and hundreds of those, so we don't list the names, but uh, we just put that there's an author. Um, for the question types, we use recall of factual knowledge, um, which is just a simple, do you know this fact, the factoid question, um, you know, can you spit information back at us? Um, the second type is interpretation or analysis of information, and those questions are usually the um, have a table of data to interpret and then apply to something, or they have a histology image or something along those lines that has to be interpreted or analyzed before they can then make a decision. Um, application basic science vignette, which is when you take an inherently basic science question and put a patient vignette around it, but it's really just asking a question about basic sciences. It's not clinical. It's not a diagnosis. It's not a um, you know any, anything like that. It's just taking a factoid and surrounding it with a, a patient case to make people think about basic sciences in a clinical context. And then clinical science vignette, which is what all the board exams questions are. Um, all questions on step one are clinical science vignettes. It's a, you know, a patient presents with certain symptoms and certain problems have already happened and interpret this and come up with a diagnosis or figure out what's wrong with them or how would you treat that and so on. Then in the general area, like I mentioned before, we have the normal, abnormal, therapeutics, and then gender behavior um, considerations. And, and those are to just kind of give a, a student a, a macro view uh, of where they are and what, how are they looking at things. Is it are they concentrating too much on everything that goes wrong? The abnormal things, oh, I know what this defect does, and I know what that disease is, and so on. And so maybe they do well in those. Um, or maybe it's the normal processes. They can get what the body does normally, but when something goes wrong, maybe they're not understanding it as well. And this allows us to kind of differentiate those things out. The 20 subject areas um, are provided for us from USMLE Step 1, and we stuck to those to be able to compare internal and external exams. Um, we wanted to be able to see if our performance in these categories internally really matched up with what the licensure was telling us about where our strengths and weaknesses are subject-wise within our curriculum. This next page is the subcategories, and it's just a small sample size of our subcategories. Um, but you can see at the top that each one of these is, has the name of one of the subject uh, categories at the top of the column. And below that are all the categories that correspond to that, so that when you choose biochemistry for your subject of the question, you then go through and you choose between all the ones listed below biochemistry um, as far as what subtopic you want to choose. And you look through and you decide, okay, protein structure and function enzymes are the actual you know, subtopic or area that we're going to go over with this question. So that's what you, you would assign it to. And there's hundreds and hundreds of these as well. 
here's an example of a question, um, and this is exactly what our professors see. We give them this, except the lower right-hand corner doesn't have the categories already filled in, though they fill those in for us. Um, but it has the statistics from maybe the last time the question was used or the previous year's exam, uh, the question itself with what the correct answer is, an image if, it's, if there's an image associated with the question, and then um, a set of fields to fill in the categorizations, and they just go through and fill them in. And we, we had really great response. We had 100% compliance with uh, implementing this program, and professors found it very easy to do, and that it really only took about an hour and a half um, for a 100-question exam um, once they got used to it. And so because of that and the benefits that come from tagging the questions, uh, we had great buy-in from our faculty. So here's some examples of the reports that uh, we can generate. And once we go through these reports, we'll really get into what the focus of today's um, workshop is, and that's um, how to use these reports for student interventions and some stories from our actual usage of this um, to kind of show you uh, the types of situations that come up. But the, the first reports, you get, a, you get some database reports that give you the overall class performance breakdown. Um, and we provide this to our curriculum leaders and faculty. And this is how did the entire class perform in each category that was assigned to the test as a whole. Um, we get a student performance breakdown, which is basically the exact same thing, but it's for a specific student. So instead of how the entire class performed in every single category, it's how that student alone performed in every single category. And those are given to each student. Then we have a student performance comparison to the class, where we allow them to compare themselves to the class average to say, is this really a difficult area that I'm struggling with and everybody else seems to get and, and I'm behind and I need to seek out some extra help here? Or is this something that you know, everybody in the class is getting at about my level and so I'm at the appropriate knowledge level for where I am in my curriculum? Um, and the students really like to be able to have that perspective. And then longitudinal performance, which is um, what, what I would say is the bread and butter of the system. We can now analyze students' performance in these categories over the course of multiple exams. And uh, for us, we have an integrated curriculum. So we don't do a pathology course and a physiology course and a biochemistry course and an anatomy course and so on. Um, we do a cardiology course. And in that ca cardiology course, um, it's a four-week block. And we do the cardiopathology and the cardiophysiology and the cardiopharmacology. And we do it all together. And um, while we feel like that's a really good way to go with our curriculum and that's how we, we want to teach it, uh, one of the things that we lost and that we found that we lost when we switched to this was that um, you now get a 85% and that other 15%, what is it? Um, what, what is the 15% the, that that student's missing or that your class is missing if you're at, you know, for us our averages run about 85%. So what's that 15% that we're missing? Is it the anatomy portion? Is it the pharmacology portion? Is it the pathology portion? Um, previous to doing this, this categorization and being able to break down these results, we didn't know. We had to guess at what that 15% was. And when you tried to fix it, when you tried to bring that 15% up, Sometimes you would break something else, and you didn't know what you broke when you were fixing the other thing. And so it really allowed us to do more targeted correction and then take, you know, maybe there's 10 pathology questions over the course of 20 different exams. Well, 10 is such a small sample size that it really can't accurately tell a student whether or not they're good or bad at pathology. But 200 is a huge enough sample size to definitely tell them whether or not they're struggling or doing well with pathology, um, especially when that's spread out over the course of their two years um, in 20-some exams. So the ability to longitudinally analyze their performance um, allows us to get back to that level of detail with, without you know, separating our curriculum out. Um, we can get back to the level of detail of when the curriculum was separate, and you would know exactly what someone was struggling with. And you can track it over time and really try and intervene and see if you can improve that. And it gives the, the student the ability to have a much better holistic view. So here's an example of the, um, this is the same report that either a student would get or that a, a block leader would get about the entire curriculum. And it breaks down, um, you know, how many questions there were in each question type, what the score performance was in those. Um, it enabled us to really kind of map our curriculum and see how much are we testing certain things. And for the students, they can see how they're doing in very specific areas and, and use, utilize that information. This is uh, what I was talking about before with the student ability to compare themselves to the class. And uh, we provide these radar plots to the students and enable, to enable them to look at, am I doing better than the class, or is the same with the class, or worse than the class, and, and, and use that to help kind of direct where they're going to spend their time, because they can't spend their time on everything. Um, they need to kind of targetedly choose how to spend their time. And this enables them to do that some. 
this is an example of a longitudinal um, analysis. And you know, from a curricular standpoint, one of the things that first jumps out at us is there was 1,100 questions in our recall category and 300 in our clinical science vignette. Um, and that's something that we are working really hard to change as a school, and that this enables us to see these kinds of things. We already always knew we had more recall than anything else, but now we can see that we have um, see the exact numbers and really start to try and do things about it. And you can see where um, a student can now look at, okay, there's 300 nervous system questions in the curriculum, and I'm doing 86%. That's valid. Now, maybe there's only eight behavioral science ones so far because we haven't gotten to our behavioral science unit. So that 100% doesn't necessarily mean that I'm an expert in behavioral science. But the, the report contains enough information for the student to be able to decipher that for themselves. Some other TEDIQ applications before we go into the specific examples of, of how to intervene with students and how to use this information to intervene with students um, are for item banking. We now have a fully searchable, sortable item bank where you know we can find, we can tell a professor who wants a uh, cardiopathology question that has a difficulty index of, of um, or a p-value I should say of 0.7 and a discrimination index of uh, 0.3 and a point by serial of 0.4, uh, you know, find that within the bank. Um, we can do that. You know, we can pick out any specific category and filter by it, and it enables us to really have a much greater organization level on our on our items rather than just being in a bunch of Word documents on faculty members' computers. Um, exam blueprinting, the ability to um, pick out, you know, outline what topics need to be covered in an exam and then make sure we have a, a question or questions assigned to all of those different areas. We want to improve our exam quality and the ability to track these things, blueprint these things, um, you know, monitor our statistics on the questions, monitor our performance in certain categories and stuff, all of, all of that contributes to improving our quality. We wanted more effective performance feedback and it, definitely uh, accomplishes that, and we'll go into that more in a minute. For remediation, our students, uh, they used to be able to review their original exam that they failed. Uh, and we found that what students would do is memorize that exam, because our remediation exams were comprised of 50% old questions and 50% new questions. And students would memorize and score almost a perfect on the questions they had seen before, and then they would still fail the new questions they hadn't seen before, but they would end up passing the remediation because they, they were able to memorize all the other questions. And what we were able to do utilizing um, TEDIQ is replace the, um, the ability to review exams with the report and use the report for that purpose to direct them to what they needed to work on, take away the ability for them to see the exams, and eliminate that inflated score. So uh, it has a lot of applications for remediation. If you're interested more on that, uh, we've written a white paper on it that um, Ken has access to, and he'd be able to uh, give you that if you want it. Uh, in addition, for USMLE Step 1 preparation, um, we can give them those longitudinal reports, and they can look at their performance and decide okay, I'm doing particularly poorly in these three USMLE Step 1 subject areas. My three extra study days I have during my period of time to study for the, the boards, I'm going to take those three extra days and spend them on these three topics because they're my weakest. Um, and they can kind of direct themselves more in that way. For curricular management, um, we can we use this now to refine our blocks. When something's going wrong with the block, we can tell what topic it's in, what author, what you know, what maybe what faculty members contributing, who we need to talk to, and it allows us to do targeted correction to our curriculum rather than doing uh, just blanket cur um, curriculum correction and hoping that it fixes the problem we need. And then for accreditation purposes, um, we are gearing up for our LCME visit next year. Um, and one of the things this enables us to do is say, here's where we taught all these different things. Here's how the students performed on all those things. Here's a report of our, as a school's performance in all these different areas. Um, and so it helps simplify the accreditation process. Um, and, and we have a feeling that since this is a lot of the information they've asked for in years past, and we've had a hard time supplying that when they come next year, it's, it's going to there, it's going to be something they like. Uh, but it's not something we've actually gone through a full LCME accreditation with yet. So there are three. Um, I don't know why it's not here. I apologize for the third one, but we'll go through it anyway. There are three types um, of students that we're going to talk about here as examples of, of intervening. One is the underperforming student who's struggling to achieve minimal competency within the curriculum. Maybe they're failing exams. They're um, at high risk to pass or to fail step one. They aren't. Um, they maybe are high risk to not make it through med school at all. Um, 
that those areas we end up spending a lot of resources and a lot of time on uh, time on, and we want to do what we can to get people out of that category and and move them up the scale and enable them to achieve uh, competency in what they're they're trying to do, so that we can uh, continue them in the curriculum and, and watch them grow. For the average student, um, they may be achieving to the normal average, but they they want to grow. They want to. They don't want to just necessarily be content with where they are. Um, th this is what we like to call the 15 percent. Uh, what is the 15 percent? I'm getting an 85. I'm not content with my 85. What is the 15 percent I miss on every exam uh, that is going to that is holding me back from being in the top category? Uh, and the top category, not pictured there, is the high achieving student. And that's a, a student area that can sometimes get neglected a little bit um, as we spend so much time dealing with underperforming students and students who are at risk. Um, the student who's a, a very high performer but who wants to develop areas of advanced competency. There's nothing they really need to work on, but they, they want to be able to take something that they're good at and develop an expertise in it. And this will help enable to do that. And we're going to go through an example of, of how we've used this with each one of those types of students. So this is student A, and uh, with student A, we, we found a couple of different things. We found that th this is an example of a student who's um, not struggling to meet minimal competency within the curriculum. Uh, it's a student who is maybe at risk for pass um, not, not passing, uh, will fail out. And we take a look at this, and when we sit them down with our, our, our counseling people, they're really resistant to change, and they're really resistant to try and uh, they, they think they, they can just try harder and work harder, and they're going to be able to accomplish this, and they'll be able to get past their problems. And eventually, when that didn't work, the student came back to us and said, okay, you know, I'm ready to listen now because nothing's working, and I want to do better, so what do I got to do? And when we, we sat down and looked at the student, we looked at an 81.5% per, um, uh, score in recall questions. So remembering the facts was not a problem for the student. But as you look down through those question types, and really in that case, thought processes, when you get to clinical science vignettes, they're scoring only a 61.02%. And that immediately brings up a couple of red flags. What is it about the clinical science vignettes that uh, the student is struggling with? Is it the way they're studying the material? They're not able to, uh, they're not studying in a way that allows them to synthesize it, only recall it. Uh, they're not thinking about it in the correct context and approaching it from an angle that has a clinical mindset um, at the center of it. Or is it maybe clinical science vignettes are longer stems and is this a reading comprehension issue? Um, so on. But it, it begins to target these things. So we went through with the student this report and we looked again and we see, okay, now we look at the normal processes and those are good too. But the abnormal processes dip down um, a considerable amount. And that kind of gives us our next clue towards, well, this is, this is a student now who's probably having trouble synthesizing the information because the abnormal processes are where multiple steps are required and things aren't going correctly and you have to figure out why and it requires a lot more thought. And so we, we examined the student study habits and went through what are you doing to study, how much time are you spending studying, where do you study, um, you know, show us how you approach this, do you podcast our classes because that's something we offer, or do you uh, go to class every day, um, you know, and get a picture of the student and then apply it to this. and what our academic counselor was able to do was alter the student's approach on how they were studying the material. They were making flashcards and running through them hundreds of times a day and rewriting their notes over and over again to try and uh, memorize them and, and all those sorts of things, which is why they were doing okay with the recall questions. But uh, they weren't thinking of things in a critical mindset. They weren't linking any of these facts together, and they were really severely struggling with that. Um, and, and that's where you could see, if you look down, down in the subject areas, some of the areas that maybe lend themselves a little bit better to memorization, the student did well in, like general hints, principles of health and disease, or anatomy and embryology, um, nutrition. Those are areas where the student did particularly well because they lend themselves to memorization and studying. But then when you look at the more clinical ones, cardiovascular system, uh, pathology, uh, renal urinary system, reproductive endocrine system, respiratory system, all those were very low. It's because they weren't approaching things with a clinical mindset. So this student was able to um, work through things with our academic counselor, uh, get the correct tutoring, and change their performance based on the fact that they knew what was wrong. Um, and it wasn't a matter of working 
harder, which is the old adage of working smarter, um, figuring out what was wrong with your approach and altering it rather than just trying that same approach for more hours and with more dedication and with less sleep, um, which is what most of our students end up doing. If you go on to student B, again, this is the, the kind of average um, student. And, and this student is a student who really desired to be one of the top students, who wanted to have every opportunity they could possibly have going forward and um, kind of took the approach, a wholehearted approach to that there's 15% of knowledge I'm not knowing, that's 15% of things that when I have a patient someday I need to know. And, and I want to have 100% of that knowledge, whether I get the questions right or not. I need to understand why I'm missing this so that I can improve improve my ability to help people when I get in out, out into the field. And so we sat down with this person as well and looked through their category report. And the, the situation with the student A didn't really apply here because we looked and, you know, recall and application clinical science vignettes were, were very much almost the same, almost identical within a percent of each other. Uh, not something to be concerned about at all, and both were above average. But when you looked at the basic science vignettes, um, it kind of stuck out a little bit that it was 12, 14 percent below the other areas. And then as we scanned through um, some of the, the, the subject areas below, you notice that uh, biochemistry is considerably lower than all the other areas. And what we found was that with this particular student, the basic science content, the foundational science content that was presented at the beginning of each block um, as a foundation to all the clinical knowledge coming later, they weren't approaching that with any sort of uh, clinical aspect in mind. They knew the material very well, they understood the material very well, but they were thinking of it almost like an undergrad biochemistry course. Um, and, and in that sense, they weren't taking any of that stuff and applying it to case scenarios. They weren't applying it to um, you know, what it was going to mean when an actual patient presented with some sort of disease or some sort of ailment that um, the, the the basic sciences were the core cause of or the root of. And so when we looked at it and we, we looked at that biochemistry score, we were able to sit them down with the biochemistry professor for the majority of our blocks and say, you know, get them to talk about what's going on, how are they approaching it. And they were approaching biochemistry in a very undergraduate level way and not with a clinical mindset. And when he was able to correct that with this student and, and show them how to tie these things into all that other clinical knowledge they're being taught during the rest of the block, the student was able to improve their score. And the student was able to kind of close those gaps that they were finding on every single exam because biochemistry is a part of almost every single one of our blocks. Um, and, and that really was, you know, that took her to a level that she had not been able to necessarily reach before. With student C, um, student C is a high performing student. Um, there's no area on here that when you look at it says, oh, you need to work on this, you've got a problem, or let's target this or that or whatever. Um, for student C, they're looking for that advanced competency, that expertise in something, um, the ability to really develop um, something going forward that sets them apart even more from the other students um, and gives them opportunities. And, you know, as we sat down with the student to go over their performance and kind of see what the next steps were, because they weren't content with just, you know, getting the scores they were getting, we looked at it in, in the terms of, you know, what are you looking at for career development? What do you want to specialize in? Um, you know, those sorts of things. And we looked and the student was doing very, very well at neurology and very, very well at pathology. Um, two areas that are heavily covered, but yet they were scoring uh, really off the charts high at 98% plus in those in those areas. And they were those were areas that the student had never really considered um, for specialization, had never really done research in or anything like that. And so our students are given Med 1, uh, the summer between Med 1 and Med 2 off of school. And they're, they can do whatever they want with it, but most of our students do research. So this student in particular chose to take that summer to do um, some research in neurology in a lab here on campus to really explore whether the, the student had an interest in this area, whether it was something they really wanted to pursue. And um, they, they chose what area based on the fact that they were doing so well throughout the course of our curriculum on that subject. And you know, it turned out that the, the research experience went very well. The student grew a lot from it, really was able to develop an expertise in that area, um, and, and is now, as they go into Med 3-4, setting up their electives and their different you know, choice rotations they have and stuff. They're setting those things up to, um, 
gear themselves up for a potential match in neurology, and that's what they're going to preference and um, as they go forward the, as their area of specialty. And so um, they're taking every opportunity with extracurricular activities and, and so on to try and focus in that direction. And they were able to find that because of this. Uh, a lot of students come in, maybe they already know what they want to do or have an idea or so on. Some people don't. Um, they want to see it and experience it and figure out what they're good at. And in this sense, we were able to outline, you're really good at this. Let's, let's try to explore this further. For us, the next steps um, on this, this mountain of data that we've uh, accumulated is to maximize its use. Uh, we're using it as much as we possibly can. Our tutors, our academic counselors, our deans, our directors all have access to this data and use it um, when meeting with students and when with, with struggling students um, or just to understand the students and the curriculum better. But there's, there's so much more we can continue to refine and there's so much data that needs to be dug through to find trends and find correlations that we can then use to improve our students and improve our curriculum. And so that's, that's one of our big next steps. And the other one is, uh, utilizing this data um, for research, such as, you know, how do we predict step one performance better using some of this categorical data than we do with just your overall blanket score from Ed 1 2? How, uh, you know, is our intervention effective uh, when we target it in these specific areas? Can we see measured improvement in the area we targeted and start trying to actually measure and put a number on our intervention um, effectiveness? And so um, at this point, it's just a matter of taking these things and applying them to the fullest, measuring it, figuring out which ways it's the most effective to use this information, and then, and then maximizing that even further. So with that, uh, I'm going to bring Ken back on here. And um, if you have any questions, um, I've got some submitted here that I'll go through and answer. And then as more roll in, Ken can grab them and, and uh, send them over to me. But there's a question here that says, um, did you have a quality control process in place to review the categories and subcategories that the faculty used for their specific questions? Did you have a pilot process? Uh, what we did, we took one of our areas, uh, our immunology course that we call host defense, uh, was notoriously one of our most difficult and one of our lowest areas, um, areas of, of score on step one. And it, the course director was redoing almost the whole course every year, trying to correct whatever the problem was. And uh, we, we started with him for a pilot, um, and because the, the data would be so valuable to him, we thought he would be happy to buy in, and he was. And he was able to take that information, use it, and start doing targeted correction and tweaks to the course, and picking out the particular areas and faculty members that people were struggling with, and work with them, and work with that content, see what they could do about it. Maybe give more time to some content and less to others, but do it very targetedly. And so we did that as a pilot process for one block. And by the, as soon as the rest of the faculty got wind of it um, and, and saw how effective it was, everybody bought in right away. Um, as far as a quality control process in place, one of the nice things about this is that it's completely retroactive. Um, you apply the categories to the questions, and any time that question has ever been used, um, no matter how many years back you go, uh, as long as it's within the, the system, you you get that data. So when we applied all these categories to our questions, we had all the category data from our previous year's questions and the added bonus to that is if you mess it up, it's not a big deal because you can always pull up a question and say, this is completely miscategorized, tweak it, fix it, and then regenerate the data instantly, and you don't have to worry about it. It's not like it has to be perfect, set in stone, reviewed 10 times before you can put it in place because if you get it wrong and the students take the test, then you're going to get the wrong data back and you can't correct for that. Uh, no, it's completely retroactive and can be applied to previous examinations. Um, just by simply adding the categories to the previously used questions. So um, at first we didn't. The first process was just get it in place. Um, and we did that. And we would watch for some things. You know, if you were using the same category for every single question, uh, that would pop a red flag to me. And I might call the professor and walk them through, hey, I don't think you're really understanding what we're trying to use this for. Let's go over this again. Um, and then the second year we had it in place, we send the questions back out now that they're already tagged. Um, and we said, okay, review these. And as you go through and you know make up this year's exam, take a look at last year's and see if there's anything that needed tweaking that doesn't seem to make sense to you now that you've been using this data for, for a little bit longer. And so then that happened. And then our third year, we've now put in a test item review process. And we have a team of 15 faculty members who are reviewing every single question within our curriculum uh, for quality and, and appropriateness and effectiveness and so on. And 
as part of that process, they're examining the category tags that other faculty have put on there um, as a second set of eyes to, to really double check, and those can be tweaked during that as well. So originally, no, but yes, we do now, and uh, it's really been the, the flexibility of it and the fact that you don't have to be perfect really helps you to launch something this big into place very quickly. Um, we did it on an exam-by-exam basis as we rolled through a year. Um, by the end of the year, everything was done. Looks like we have another question that says, do you have any online qu uh, classes and do you think this could be used in that environment given the remote location of students? Um, yes and no. I mean, technically, yes, absolutely. It can be used in an online situation. Um, but, but the thing is, and if it's in a non-proctored environment, um, really the quality and the reliability of the category data starts to come into question. Because when our students take them in a proctored environment where I know their performance on the questions is not influenced by anything but how well they've learned the material, I can then look at their categorical data and make a lot of good conclusions from it because it's reliable. But if I let a student take it at home, whether it's in secure mode on their computer or not, everybody's got an iPhone, an iPad, you know, some sort of extra device um, or a roommate's laptop or whatever else where they can look up answers or, or whatever else. Um, and if it's not in secure mode, then they don't even have to go to that much trouble to look up answers. And so all of a sudden, yeah, you could give them that same performance breakdown report. And for some students, it might be helpful. But on the whole, your data is going to be influenced by the fact that students were able to look up um, the information, and so it might not be a reliable um, measure of what their knowledge actually is. So um, this, the software itself that we use to give exams absolutely can 1,000% be used in any sort of environment for online classes or, or in-class classes or, you know, hybrids of the two. The actual TEDIQ system and the categorical data can both be used in both as well, but uh, I, I don't think it's necessarily reliable if you're doing it on, on take-home quizzes or exams that are taken at home, things like that. Um, how long did it take to set this database up? I'm working with a nutrition program, so the questions and subcategories that have been created are not relevant, relevant to our program, but the concept might be very helpful. And that's actually a great point, because one of the things that we did when we decided to sy design this system, we wanted it to be completely and totally flexible. We outlined six category areas that we felt like were important to us, and then we populated them with things. But the nice part about the, the methodology behind this is it absolutely doesn't matter what those categories are. They could be about anything, any subject area. They could be about any content type. They could be any level of education, high school, undergrad, grad school, med school, law school, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, you get to populate it. We, I mean, we've been willing to give ours out, and we've given ours to a lot of medical schools because we all seem to have similar interest in this, but um, you know, if you've got something more specialized, you simply take our table, wipe the categories out of it, and fill in your own. And then you can categorize and group and report on things the same way we can, except for it's the content that you want to see. Um, and, that, and that's really the, the flexibility of the system is one of its greatest strong suits. Uh, we have used question mark in the past. Have you used question mark, and how does it compare to exam soft? Well, um, First, I'm sorry. Um, we yes, we have used question mark, and not to spend too much time talking about um, a software that we're not using anymore and that we weren't too pleased with. But um, you know, there were some major differences and some things. We had a lot of problems. We lost a lot of exams. We had a lot of crashes, um, and that was what necessitated our change. I was actually brought in five years ago to Ohio State to change our exam software system. They wanted us to get rid of what we had and bring in something new um, because of the problems we were having. So um, to kind of focus in on what we're actually doing rather than talking about some, somebody else's software, uh, what I'll say is the, we went from something that required constant connectivity to the internet to a software that doesn't require connectivity other than for a few seconds to download at the beginning of the exam, which can be done from home or anywhere because the file's encrypted and the students can't access it until you let them. Um, and then they don't need internet connection again until they go to upload the exam. And again, by the time they're uploading, the exam file is encrypted and, and they can't access it and they can't change anything. So you can let them go across the street to Starbucks and upload their file if they need to. So the losing that, that constant connectivity um, issue really removed a lot of our exam crashes, a lot of our saving problems, all those sorts of things. Um, and Question Mark did not have a categorization system, which ExamSoft did. Um, and they were actually willing to really beef it up and, and customize some of it for us and what we were trying to do. And the, those capabilities are now you know, uh, fluid within their system, which is really great for any educational program. 
Um, have you ever had any connectivity issues during the exam? Well, to kind of expound upon before, uh, no, we don't because we don't need connectivity during the exam. Um, the MBME requires constant connectivity during their exam, so we get very few of those because wireless is an inherently uh, unreliable medium. Uh, we spent $90,000 upgrading our auditorium. We brought in network engineers and experts and software people and hardware people and you know people who have people and so on. And they they all came to us and said, this is as good as it's going to get when you've got 250 people in one room with a bunch of different you know radio waves bouncing around the hallway and so on. You're only going to achieve a certain success rate and you're only going to be able to maintain it for a certain amount of time before there's just going to be some inherent um, you know, issues that creep up or losses of connectivity that happen. And yeah, when you're able to just surf the internet, something stops working for a second, and reconnect, that's fine. That's one thing. But in the middle of a high stakes exam where you can't lose connectivity or, or it affects the exam, it becomes a major problem. So it really reaffirmed our choice to go with a software that didn't need that constant connectivity. Um, and, and it's really just wireless is not designed for that sort of thing. Now, if you've got a wired lab, that's a different story. But uh, you know what we found was it was really cost prohibitive to have, especially with, with a class as large as ours, 250 students, having a place where we either had to give three or four sessions of the same exam throughout the day, which has all kinds of security issues, no matter how good your honor code is, um, or we would have to, uh, you know, split things up and do different versions. It just, you know, spend a ton of money to try and build a lab big enough, and then only use it once every four weeks. That didn't really make a lot of sense to us. So, um, you know, we don't really have issues with connectivity during the exam because we chose a software that doesn't need to be connected. Um, how quickly do you send learning outcome information to students? Uh, instantly, they see their score as soon as they're done. They know it's a preliminary score. It might change based on a rescoring. We might throw a question out or something after an exam. Uh, but then we also just go into the software, hit a button, and it releases that report to them. They have a place where they can log in and see it 24-7. Uh, we give it to them instantly. And so they get that instantaneous feedback while they're thinking about it. They've just taken the exam. It's fresh in their mind. Let me look at my feedback and how I did. Um, and then they can look at it going forward, too. OK, I'm getting ready for my next exam. What did I struggle on in the last one? Let me take a look. Uh, so instantly, uh, we were able to give them that information. Uh, how much of what you've shown is on ExamSoft and how much is your own doing? Uh, the only things that are my own doing are the radar graphs, which um, from what Ken tells me is coming very soon, um, hopefully sometime this coming fall, but there's not an exact date for it yet. Um, the rest of it is reports that are produced by ExamSoft. We don't, um, the, all the data is in their software. We set the parameters. We choose what exams we want to analyze. We choose what stats we want to see and so on, but uh, we hit buttons and it generates for us, which is really, really nice because we used to try and do some of these things, but do them by hand. Uh, and that was very, very difficult. Hey, Eric, there's been one other question that's come in, and then we'll use this as our last question. So the question is, how have professors use the new reports that you've created? Uh, the professors use the reports uh, in kind of a multitude of different ways. Um, they, they use them when meeting with students, uh, first and foremost. Uh, whenever somebody comes to a professor, we have so many students, and it's hard for our professors to necessarily know them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, so what we do is give them a report on that student before they, they meet, and that way the professor can understand who is this student, where are they come, what, you know, where are they coming at me from, what is their story, what is their um, background within our curriculum, what are their strengths and weaknesses, so that when they come, I can understand them better and help them better uh, and, and help them digest this information. Sometimes the students um, need a little bit of guidance in that. The other thing I would say is that they use it for refining their own courses. We have maybe 30 professors in each of our um, blocks within the curriculum, and we might look at it and say, you know, Professor A and B, students are really struggling with your content. Let's put some more time in so you can spend more time on it. Or we need to really reformat how we're doing your content delivery. Or your questions maybe are the reason why. We need to improve your questions. Here's some faculty development on how to write questions. Um, or you know what? Your area is doing so well that we need to cut some time from it and give it to somebody else. Uh, this isn't totally necessary, so on. So it, it gives them a very targeted uh, ability to correct things within their block. Um, and they use it very, very frequently for that. And you know, uh, the block leaders are just as competitive as the students. Every once in a while, they like to say, hey, look at what my block's doing. Your block, you know, you need to get on that. And, and so there's measurable 
ways to tell the difference between a good and a bad block now rather than anecdotal, and that kind of lit a fire under some of our faculty. Well, Eric, thank you very much for your time today and running through all these questions. Um, with that final question, we'll end the webinar. Uh, this webinar will be available in the coming days. And we want to thank everybody for their time. And Eric, thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.